Boom. Mitchell Robinson, an excellent defender. Had a big role tonight. As Beasley. Mm. Beasley, relocation, relocation. You got to relocate. Anytime you see a double go, you're either going to cut or you got to relocate so that when that one player has to make that first pass rotation, they have to rotate a longer distance, which is what Beasley does here. Because say if he stayed right here, boom, he kicks right to here to Beasley. He could easily guard one with two. So now Beasley moves more corner. Excellent. Grimes has a longer rotation. And if he wanted to, boom, all these rotations are super long. So. And these possessions right here, these are the ones that hurt. Because you'll go back and look at, look at the score of the game and see how things turned out. And now you're like, damn, we lost by four points. Someone could have at least stayed in and not assume that you already got the ball already. You could have got that right there. And so now it's just like you get another three points. And then if you see how the game turned out, they're within two with like 20 seconds. And then boom. Randall. Hey, you remember what I said in that Kings Knicks breakdown I did a few days ago? Remember what I said? Every time Randall goes right, he's going to try to draw a foul. Every single time, he's going to try to draw a foul, right? Every time. No jokes. No jokes. Every time. Every time. Now, Randall, look, he went crazy in this in this game right here. In the first three quarters, let me say. And on this position, what I want to talk about is ball manipulation. So, I notice how D'Lo gets into this gap, right? And he kind of holds that ball a little longer, twists it, throws it in front of him. It looks super basic, but actually takes a lot of skill to be moving this speed in the game and kind of do it natural off instinct to manipulate the ball so you can get yourself through a gap. It's tough. That's tough. That's something you just work on throughout the years. It becomes natural. You see quickly steps in, try to get a hand in there, make a reach, play on that. He's not able to reach it. And D'Lo manipulates it, put it in front of him instead of putting it to his side where he quickly could be able to make a reach on that. I know a lot of y'all be getting caught in this situation right here. I know, I promise you, a lot of y'all have been at least caught in this situation one time. If you hoop, you've been in this situation at least once. At least once. Let me know. And so where you're trying to initiate this pass in the post, and then you see this player, like, because you're really seeking it. You picked up your dribble. You're kind of looking them down and everything. And now your player begins to drop back because they see that, they see that you're trying to get the ball into the post. Allow them to continue to drop back. And as they go more back, you take that shot. Because, boom, right here, you see how much space he got? Look how much space he got. He just, Troy Brown continues just to walk back. So, literally, take that shot. Why not shoot it? Why not shoot it? You're wide open. Now, even though it's like, okay, he's trying to get a post up, but now he's getting denied. He's getting double teamed. So, why are you going to even throw that pass? If they do try to say, why the hell would you shoot that? You know what I'm saying? Mm. And now, and the key to this. Is that like I told you before? Like I told you in the last the Kings Knicks breakdown, when Randall wants to go to the rim, when he wants to be aggressive and play in the paint, he's gonna be able to get buckets. Regardless if you know he's already gonna go left, he's still gonna be able to do, do what he wants to do. He's still gonna be able to do what he wants to do, but he doesn't go to it oftentimes. Like you've seen him do it in this first half, especially. And then the second half, they put AD on him, but now there's another counter to that that I'm gonna tell you later on that they need to do. And so, boom, you got Rui Hachimura. Hachimura is a solid player against bigger players. He's, he's good at taking on contact. And by the way, I live stream all my breakdowns. So if you want to see these videos a day or two early or got any questions for me, want me to watch your film, make sure you go hit that link in the description. Go follow. And also, subscribe, like, and turn on notifications. Let's get right back to it. But Randall still going left. It's going to force you to foul him. Whereas when he goes right, he's going to seek the foul. Again, Jared Vanderbilt, hard drive going left. Goes through him, gets a foul. He has a better handle than people think, and I also feel that he's stronger than people think. So you combine those two, and now going left is just tough to guard, even though you know he's going left. Mm. And now right here by Reeves, by Reeves. Now he tried to be the person to make, make every play on this. He, he tried to be the person to make the play. But sometimes you got to make the pass for somebody else to make the play. Because, boom, you got McBride. McBride, he doesn't get much playing time, but he's a really good defender. You see him play, he's a, he's a really good defender. Great hands. And a matter of fact, any player who's in this situation should be able to get a hand on this if they just have active hands. So, boom, McBride gets a tip on this. But what Reeves should do in the situation is just give this to Gabriel, who has Hartenstein, who's on the drop on him. And then the person who came over on your double was Randall. So now notice Vanderbilt cutting. And if you give this to Winnie Gabriel right here in the middle of the floor, 
this allows Winnie Gabriel to see everything that's in front of him. He, he could see Hartenstein. He could see Barrett. So now he can make this corner skip like he tried to do right here. But that pass was just not, I ain't gonna lie, that pass was just not gonna go through, gang. <laughs> that pass was not gonna go through, bro. Like, look, look at this. He throws it across his body back to his right hand. There's just no way that pass gets through on an NBA court. There's just no way it does. So give it to Gabriel in the middle and that player in the middle because they can see everything, no pressure, be able to make the right play. And now you see, this is what happens when you're aggressive. This is what happens. Now, since he's been able to get to the rim, he's been able to establish himself from the inside. He's starting to get, he's starting to feel good. So now once he goes back and takes those shots, not only is he going to have more space because the defense is like, okay, he's taking the ball inside. He's not playing. All right, we need to stop the paint before he stopped the jumper. And so now since they back off a little bit, they're worried more so about what he does in the paint. He gets a little more space. And on top of that, he's already feeling good. So when he shoots that three, he's like, all right, I'm good. I'm good. He's just laying it off. He ain't thinking about it. He's not hesitating. No pump fakes. No, any, no anything. He's just letting him go. And that's how you should be playing. No hesitation. Just let let all those shots off, teams. But going back to the game, though. Hey, made the play. It was up to Gabriel at that point. He got the ball to Gabriel, but it could have been. They could have been in a little better situation right here. Just a little better. So notice as Beasley's getting chased. He's coming underneath from this baseline. He's getting chased. And Gabriel's setting the screen. I don't know why the screen keep doing that shit. But he's setting the screen, right? And notice once he decides to go make this curl, because once somebody's chasing you, the counter to this is a curl. Whether it's a down screen, cross screen, all, all that. The counter is that is to curl right off that screener. So now they're on your backside, and you're almost attacking it like it's a drop coverage and a pick and roll. But you're already in range at this point, because notice where this is taking place near this left block in this mid-range area. So if he curls this just a little sooner, because notice how wide he comes off of this. You see how wide he comes off of this? Whereas if he came right off of Gabriel, boom, he's already right here. Now this little distance, you're like, okay, it not, might not be, that's not too much, it's not really gonna do much. But you're catching the ball with no dribble and range to get to your float game. In this area right here, you're gonna have to take another dribble if you wanna be a, a scoring threat, at least to Hartenstein, because nobody really is gonna take these jumpers right here, unless you're like a BI or something. But still, catch this boom right here, curl this right off of Gabriel, stay tight to him, literally rub shoulder off his shoulder or maybe to his back, curl that. Now Hartenstein, that makes it super hard. And now you don't even have to take this dribble. You can just hit Gabriel right here. He goes in and attacks. Hartenstein tries to contest, but he's jumping from A to B. And if he's not jumping from A to B, it's going to be super tough to even make that block. So. Uh, it's a little miscommunication. Now, this is another play. It was just like, damn, you could have fixed this play right here. You could have fixed this too. I mean, that cuts the lead down. Now you're down by two points in the last minute or 30 seconds or so. You just look back at these plays like this. That could have easily been fixed. And I know things don't transpire the exact same way, but it's things you got to patch up within a game, like errors like this or the offensive rebound earlier. That just shouldn't happen in general. So literally could have been stopped by communication. That's all it took. On the drive, Schroeder looks, kicks it out. Reeves, three pointer. Mm, the thing with this is peep, peep Josh Hart. Peep Josh Hart, right? So Vanderbilt can't shoot. He gets the catch, swings it immediately over to Reeves. Immediately over. He doesn't even look at the rim. That's something that Russ does when he's now that he's with the Clippers, he got shooters, catches it, swings it right over to the shooter. Cause now if they're in rotation, it's gonna be one person playing against two. So now, especially if you're in high school watching this right here, if you're in high school or even college, what the counter to that is, is that you just don't even close out to the non-shooter. You just go straight to the shooter. But in high school and college, like I was just saying, it's players aren't going to be conscious enough and aware enough to do that. So if you're a non-shooter and you catch the ball and the defense is in rotation, swing it right over super quick. Because usually that player, like I said, they're not conscious enough. They're not going to be aware enough to be like, okay, let me be a step ahead. Let me go straight to the shooter and leave the non-shooter open, even though the non-shooter just caught it. So that's what, if you can't shoot, that's another counter to that. Now, if they counter that right there, they go straight to non-shooter, you catch that, you go downhill. There's more, there's just another ways to attack it. There's continuous counters, it's like a chess game. Mm. Now, I could say this, it's probably for everybody in here. If you ever get into the middle of the zone, it's very tricky to play. It's super tricky to play. Because you're getting into the middle, then you have five different players who are around you 
So you got five players who eyes are in, who they all want to pinch in. So now you don't have too much space. You have to make a play. And you kind of feel under pressure. I can kind of speak for everybody when they get into this space. But what D'Lo does to be able to alleviate some of that pressure, using ball fakes, using a pump fake. Notice. As soon as he catches this right here, ball fake the top end. Top end thinks he's going to get out. A little more space to his right. Gets that another one. Pump fake on McBride. Takes that dribble. Gets him to a shot and one. D'Lo's going crazy too. Flip. Bad play to make. You give up easy too. Mm. D'Lo's going crazy in this first half. At one point, he was like 12 for 14 from the field with like five or six threes. Now, peep, peep Grimes, right? And peep D'Lo. But boom. He comes over to set this screen, but D'Lo doesn't pick a side. D'Lo does not go. Right? D'Lo is still in line with that screen. He doesn't go right. He doesn't go left. But Grimes decides to engage himself into that screen with, with Rui. Instead, you should just get yourself up and step up. Because now, on top of that, you're going to chase over that screen. So now that he engaged himself early on with Rui, it doesn't allow him to be able to stay attached to D'Lo and allows Rui to continue to move, continue to separate. And there's really no need for communication by Randall because he didn't pick a side. He didn't go right. He didn't go left. None of that stuff. And so, boom, D'Lo just walks him down. Rui walks him down. D'Lo gets an open three. Oh, my gosh. Lakers, I ain't going to lie. Forget all those possessions I was talking about. If Troy Brown Jr. knocked down, like, two threes, they could have been they could have been solid. He was, like, 0 for 8 from the field. He was, like, 0 for 8, like, 0, probably, like, 0 for 7 or 6 from the from 3. Like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, bro. Like I said about Randall, bro, if Randall wants to attack the rim and get to where he wants to, he's going to be able to attack the rim. He's going to go left. But it's super hard to stop. It's not like Zion's level of like, oh, he's going left. He just cannot stop him. But it's like a level below that because he has a solid handle and he's stronger than most people think. Mm. I'm telling you, these three-point attempts, he was barely taking any of them in the second half or in this first half. He barely took any. And he had 20, 25, like I said, in the first half. And he took like three, three three-point shot attempts or four maybe. Like probably like two for three or two for four. So I'm telling you, if he once he begins to work his way, establishes dominance inside, sees the ball go through the rim, gets to some of his free throws, starts to feel good, defense begins to take less pressure, stop him from the paint before they stop the three, that three is going to be so much easier for him. Mm. Now Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt had one of those crazy energy nights. It was just like, oh my gosh, he was taking over. It wasn't one of those like, crazy nights like that. But I want to point this out. There's going to be a lot of times where, and you can't really learn how to do this, but Vando is really good at catching the gap so that he can make the steal before the player passing could be able to stop themselves from passing. Because notice how quickly he gets into this, and he's already letting it go, but Vando times it literally right at the right, at the right second so that he's able to, boom, get into that gap without quickly being able to bring that ball back, stop that pass from going through or whatever. Mm. Hey, now the second half. Like I told you, he had 25 in the first. That means he ended with 33 and had 8 in the second half. They switched AD onto him. They switched AD onto him, which is a great move by LA. You slowed him down for sure. But now he's starting to settle for deep threes like this with 18 seconds on the clock. 18 seconds on the clock. So now he's settling for threes. And on top of that, they do not search for mismatches. They do not do anything to try to get Randall a mismatch or Jalen Brunson a mismatch. They just let him go. And I'm going to show you another, like other possessions where they try to get the ball to Randall and just let him go against Anthony Davis, which is just not a good thing to do. It's Anthony Davis. Regardless if you think he's, regardless if he's being hurt, he's hurt all the time or whatever's going on, Anthony Davis on the court, you do not want to go and attack him straight on with no action or no nothing. It's just goofy. Setting yourself up for failure. Like, come on. That's you're doing exactly what they want you to do. And not even just the Lakers. Every single team. Every single team. So. And like this, you think you're going to catch the ball at the elbow, and be able to get something good, going against Anthony Davis, who is even better at guarding in the paint. Come on. They got to. They got to do something to make the game a little easier for him. And now, boom, I want you to repeat this closeout by Vando. Remember what I was saying about closeouts, how it's, it's really tricky to catch, 
but you've got to be super conscious of it and players at this level usually are especially when they're locked into a game like in the playoffs and whatnot they're super sharp on their schemes but and casual games like this especially with vando just switching on to rj barrett and may have not clicked to him that you've got to always try to send them right you got to always try to send them right one and then even when you do make this close out you want to send them straight to your help and this help from this corner is the baseline baseline you got the weak side help coming over and on top of that that baseline is a third help defender so you got your teammate if they do get all the way down and then you also got that baseline because it's out of bounds it's another help defender so notice how vando closes and takes away this baseline and now taking away this baseline you force him left to his dominant hand so now it's just super it's tough it's tough to um to guard you're letting barrett get to where he wants and allow him to get to space in areas where you don't have any help Hey, he, like I said, he had 25 in the first half. I keep saying he had 25 in the first half. So, boom, that's another three. He's about to have only five. Five going down to this fourth quarter. And the thing about Randall, he gets less efficient as the game begins to roll on. As the game rolls on, he gets less efficient. He's really good in the first. Second, it's going to trickle down a little bit. Third, it's going to get even worse. And then fourth, is just like it's the fourth quarter. And it's like, ah, he's not even the closer. That's why I need a, they, they need Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson is that player who's going to be able to get to where they want to at any point in the game because he doesn't settle, and he's actually capable of getting to scoring at any level. Three, he can knock down the three. Mid-range, that little float range, or that little in-between area he always gets to when he do his little bumps and fades and whatnot, that that little range, and he can also finish at the rim. He doesn't usually get to the rim. He just stays in that little area, gets to his floats, and gets to his fades. But I don't think that's going to be enough for them to contend. This is going to help him compete, be able to make the playoffs, to contend that's a different story you need a whole a higher level player like a uh, free agents like you need a damn a superstar but boom peep this peep this that hop anytime you get into this bump you always want to get it into the defender because now you're going to not only hit him and push him back that fade is going to give you a little more space a little more on that lean so you can get that shot over the top but Rui Hachimura notice how he goes into this bump boom he just gets into he just gets to a spot. He doesn't create any space. Now there's times where you can just go to a spot and then that's how you have your space. But especially on this move, you want to make that bump and get it into him. So it's harder for them not only to contest, but you can you create that space as well. Appreciate it. Boom, Austin Reeves though. The Lakers. Hey, you remember when the Lakers let go of Caruso or they couldn't pay Caruso? And they're like, oh, this is new. This is new feeling. This is low-key, really, extremely good feeling. This is an extremely good feeling. Austin Reeves for Caruso. Now, he doesn't do the same things defensively that Caruso does. But on offense, his what he's able to, his output on offense, his handle, his playmaking, his shot, like all that stuff, way better than Caruso. So in a sense, his offense is the same type of defense that Caruso brings. And he it's not like Reeves can't guard for to for his life. He can still guard a little bit. But still, it's like that that trade-off to save that money and whatnot, it's a great trade-off. Great trade-off. Mm, McBride. Like I was saying, McBride. McBride's a great defender. Or if you watch these Knicks games and you watch the time that he gets into the game. He, he's he's working on defense. He's working on defense. Off the ball, getting through screens, staying active. Go back right quick, hold on. Staying active, off the ball, staying attached. And the thing is with activity, whether it's on the ball, off the ball, you're going to allow yourself to be able to get more moving screen calls and opportunities for the person that you're going against. Because now that you're moving, now that you're super active, now that you're going against somebody, it's, it's harder for them to find you. It's more likely that they're going to be moving, trying to find you, than it is if you're just being in the same spot, not working. What up, Mix? What's good, Mix? If you ain't peep, you can you can sub now. So if you're trying to hit that sub, not with no ads, run through. Watch these with no ads. Make sure you sub you sub up. Hey, in this fourth quarter, R.J. Barrett was the savior for this fourth quarter. R.J. Barrett, he had like 11 in this fourth for like 13 or something, and boom, right there. You seen that high touch off that glass? You seen that high touch off that glass? That was that. If you if you work on your finishing, and you're not hitting that high off the glass, especially in like your little drills and whatnot, you're doing something wrong. Straight up. 
Ah, uh, that's tough. That's tough. I knew, like, we all seen the play coming, right? We all seen the play coming. But he had him sealed for too long, and it just allowed Hartenstein to be able to get in front. So he's seen it right here. And then D'Lo decides to get into the size up, takes some more time, and then he load, throws that pass super quick. And now that since he throws it super quick and that size up took a little extra time, Hartenstein is able to circle around and get in front and make a play on this. And so that pass was so quick, he could even he could even bring it back if he wanted to. He could even bring it back. Like, it was already gone out of his hands. He was like, damn, that's why you see him mad on himself right there. We even look at this right here. AD could do a better job of sealing this as, this, this as well. It could kind of go both ways. It could go both ways, really. AD, he has a hand on him right now. But if he continues just to move him back, use his body, push him back, show that hand, Hartenstein may not even be able to get in front. That boom, lobbed the top in. They got up by 10. They got up by 10. It was a close game this whole time. They found themselves up 10. Osiris' handle was smooth, bro. His handle was so smooth. And I low-key fuck with his crossover, too. I fuck with his crossover. Like, it's super quick. It's not nothing crazy. It's not no AI uh, AI crossover or nothing like that. But, like, it's super, like, it's just it's just good pace, good attack. It fits him. And that's the thing. Like, you may see a guy like AI with the crazy crossover or, like, Kyrie or something. But you got to find the move and how to use it in the best manner that it is for you. You can't try to just do it like somebody else because most times, like their ability to get low, their ability to hit angles that you just can't hit, that move just won't work. Because like I said, you can't hit those angles. You don't have that mobility. So if you're gonna try to do a move like them, it just may not work. It may not turn out the way you want, you want it to turn out. So you'll be like, oh, I've been working on this the whole time. I swear I felt like AI in my backyard. I felt like, I felt like Kyrie, but you can't hit those same angles so that by the time you face some defense, they're going to expose it because you can't you can't be able to move at that same level. So I may do that a little, little, little after. God damn, Randall, or RJ Barrett really got no right hand. RJ Barrett, <laughs> God damn. Look, right, right. Gets that right hand. That shit ain't touch nothing. That shit ain't touch nothing, gang. <laughs> oh, shit. He really got no right hand. That's crazy. They're the only they a lefty trio out there in New York. Mm. And now boom, Reeves on Randall. I've been I've been saying this for for the past every game Knicks game I watch and every time I talk about Julius Randall and the Knicks, they don't seek mismatches. But notice he gets a mismatch and this came off an offensive rebound. Don't think they ran a set and they got a mismatch. Nope, they don't do that. I don't know why they don't do that. But they just don't do it. And so now he gets Austin Reeves on him from an offensive rebound. Because offensive rebound is hard to find. So Rand or Hart, boom, offensive rebound, kicks to Barrett. Barrett kicks to Randall. And now it's just it's just this one-on-one -on -one with Austin Reeves. And he's a, he should be able to take advantage of the mismatch. Because say you got a guy like AD, boom, contesting that easy. Boom. Now they was down 10. Boom, they're down 8 right now. Boom, 122 left, right? 122. D Lo, okay. You never stop playing. Even if you lose in this landed game, it's not looking too good. Do not stop playing. You still got a chance. You still got a chance. Because especially when you get a lead like this, where it's kind of in between, where it's not a huge gap, but it's not super close, that other team's gonna get comfortable because they kind of feel like they got a little they got a little comfort. They could just relax a little bit. They don't gotta stay as focused. They don't gotta go as hard. Cause now it's like, okay, we just gotta let the clock run out and we can win the game. We cool. But then now this other team decided to punch back. But you can't be able to punch back if you stop playing and you think the game's over. So all I have to say, don't stop. Because the other team may get a little comfortable with the lead they got. So boom. Now they're down six. Reeves comes off this. Dime to AD. Down four. Just like that. And I also want to say this because goddamn some high schools got no shot clock. Some high schools got no, so, no shot clock. So it's literally at this point. They could be two minutes left in the game. They could dribble the ball out. That's why they at least need like a 30 or 35 second shot clock. That's still pretty long, mind you. But that's what they should do. I think they should go with 30. I know high schools right now are at 35. But a 30 second shot clock is solid. NBA is 24. High school is 30. So, like, I feel like, like, and 35 is low-key a little stretch. Like, that's still a lot of time. Over half a minute. You could take two possessions. That's a minute 10 if you, if you run the clock out. Going right back to this. They're down by four. Dennis Schroeder, pickup, full court, right? Full court pickup. 
And now, boom, notice. He's making plays on the ball. They have a foul to give. But he fouls in the backcourt. He fouls in the backcourt. And this is going to be something that's huge that's going to transpire later on in the game. That I don't even think anybody peeped at all. So, now shoulder fouled in the backcourt. You have a foul to give. They don't shoot free throws, but they get the ball right back. And their shot clock gets reset back to 24. Whereas it was just at 16. And you already, you already cut off about 8 seconds in the backcourt alone. So now they're getting another eight seconds. And this is about to be huge. This is about to be huge because notice this. They get the ball back. Their clock, shot clock gets reset. And R.J. Barrett does something that's dumb, though. It, he, he attacked with 13 seconds left. But boom, he missed. And now notice this. Boom. Get the rebound. The out. Schroeder. Attacks. Gets the two. But this is where those eight seconds... This look, this is where those eight seconds I was talking about where you fouled. I don't even think nobody like internalized this before about like fouling in the backcourt. I don't think anybody internalized this before. Cause now that you lost those eight seconds, there's no shot clock when they get the ball back. Cause say had they crossed half court and they took an early shot or something, or they just took a shot, they missed, and now you got back you got down quick, got a layup. They have a shot clock, so now you can guard straight up. You could guard straight up for this possession. You got two timeouts. So if you guard straight up, get the stop, boom, timeout. The ball is advanced. You down two. But now they have to foul. They have to foul right here because there's no shot clock and you can't just guard straight up. So boom. They 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 call. I think they call, no. They didn't call a timeout. But now they should have just immediately fouled. They should have immediately fouled. But now they're playing keep away. And Knicks did a great job at this. They should have fouled off the rip. They weren't able to find a body. And you see how much time they just lost off the clock? 14 seconds. 14 seconds. If you just fouled early, you had two timeouts. So you had two opportunities. Had you did score on the first one. So say so say they did foul immediately. Boom, they go to the line. They get it two. Now they take them for another chance to get to the line and shoot another two and call a timeout and get a play. They're just giving yourself more of a chance to win the game. Now Hart gets to the line. Now they're a four with five seconds, and that's the game. 